Oh yeah, I uh, wanted to talk about uh, something that was on Earth Files, presented by Linda Moen Howe. I'm a fan of Linda Moen Howe, even before I had met her, but uh, um, sometimes somebody sent me an email saying I shouldn't go over other people's research and work. you got to be kidding me, that's how you really find things out. And something that she had just presented really resonated with me, and I think it's worth discussing and just looking deeper, deeper into it and turning other people onto it, if nothing else, they may not have heard of it. So that's important. And uh, we'll go from there. You. Salutations. <laughs> it's change of the seasons. The cold weather is almost finished, so I'm looking forward to that. I hope this finds everybody well and in good health. These are trying times on our planet right now. What I wanted to discuss was um, a discovery by Linda Moulton Howe, something they were talking about on Earth Files the last two weeks from the date that I'm filming this, and it's very interesting. And I think it's worth um, giving credit where it's due there. But certain things about it catch my attention and I resonate with that I just wanted to discuss. This is concerning the TRAPPIST-1 solar system that has been found. And you know, it's interesting, um, something to bring up about this is that right now, this information is prevalent and hitting the waves for us during the time of a solar cycle. I mean, as far as the sun's very active right now, solar activity is high. And this whole thing with the TRAPPIST-8 solar system, I kind of have a thing for exoplanets, and I keep a track of that. And you know, I kind of just forgot about that. In 2018, I looked, I looked back in my database, and I had some stuff about TRAPPIST-8 and the fact that it was a, a solar system that's a red dwarf that has found seven uh, habitable planets in the habitable Goldilocks zone. Seven exoplanets. So that's, that's pretty big. And I remember hearing about that in 2018, you know, when I look it up now, but it's one of those things you just hear about and you just kind of forget about it. I think it's like a weird time skip there. It's very odd because that's a massive discovery. And what um, <clears throat> catches my attention and caught, I guess, Linda Moulton Howe's attention is that this uh, James Webb's telescope is actually being classified, the first pictures is taken or whatever, of the TRAPPIST system. Why would that be? You're classifying space? I mean, that doesn't make much sense at all. So, anyway, going forward from that, all right, is that um, she had hired um, Buddy Bolton, is the guy's name. He's a remote viewer, and he's got something to do. He's supposed to be very, fairly accurate, and he took a view of this system as well. And um, something that he saw was life in between planets... Uh, they have it categorized as Trappist, the seven planets as Trappist, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, you know, like, like that, instead of just one, two, three, for whatever reason. But between C and D, he said we were full of life, and that they were teeming with life, and also that he had seen uh, a five-mile 
cylinder UFO over planets uh, E and F, hovering over E and F, and I'll put a picture on the thing of that up, but that it was five miles long and it had contained these extraterrestrials that were more of those, um, they were blue and gray, or uh, grays, the type, type almost grays, but humanoids, but they have the big no noses with these collars, and that I find very interesting, all right, and they started comparing that to um, Holloman Base and those those type of extra, extraterrestrials that were there that had these long noses, these big noses, okay, and the roped headdress, and that comes up in our history a lot. Look around in the different cultures, you see that a lot, that roped head, headdress and things, considering what they call the, now the Anunnaki and all that, but you'll see that a lot, and something that I kind of want to correlate that with with you is when I was a kid, and when I first started hearing Betty Hill describing things, all right, and her, what she said is that something about the leader of that of the Greys, that they, he would look at a bigger nose, a nose like uh, Jimmy Durante, and that's the comedian that they used to call the snaz. He had a real big nose. And I remember her saying that. So there's something about that that I think correlates that. And if you look at that Halloman base, those extraterrestrials were also described not just gray, but having a bluish tinge to them. So I find that interesting as well. And Buddy had said that they were cousins um, of these, these beings in these cylinder craft were um, cousins of those beings at the, at the Halloman base. So that's just something to be worthy of, worthy of note. And I think when talking about a ship that long, like five miles long, that takes us to the Saturn, the rings of Saturn, and what Norman Bergen actually said, apart considering he thought that they were actually those pictures he's got, that those things out there mining or creating the rings. And I think that's, you know, a similar deal there. Uh, maybe not the same species, but those type of craft that are large like that, it's just very interesting. Uh, he also talked about the... Uh, a type of cetacean similar to like I think a manta ray that is actually capable of manipulating matter with their minds and he shows these domes that are lit up and I find that interesting for those people that are on my Patreon channel there is a, a video I did called Oshar and that is actually an experience I had with a being that was uh, non-physical but more of a light and it was an aquatic type of experience. I don't talk about that much because it wasn't physical exactly. Not all communications are like that. But that's on my Patreon channel about Oshar. But basically that was a green light. And I think that what you're dealing with these manta rays he's seeing are doing the same thing. This being had shown me these like almost crystalline structures, cities that were strictly made to contain consciousness. Not even physical, I think more in light form. So anyway, it's something similar there, just a food for thought, if nothing else, all right? Um, he also talks about other glowous, glowing amphibians on the planet that would be, I think, maybe one or two. So that's real, real good, something to think about, and just cross-referencing that with what we know about extremophiles. You know, extremophiles can exist anywhere, almost. I mean, so, <laughs> vents anywhere. Europa's example of that as well. So I think that's something to kind of take into, into uh, consideration also. Um, uh, you know, for fun, something I'm going to throw in here, because I've tried to get through this fairly quick, so you have the, you'll be inspired to go look up and list these interviews yourself, all right? But uh, something just fun, food for thought, is that also... The planet that Superman is supposed to be from, the Ryle of Krypton, that's a red dwarf. And it's just kind of fun to think what type of humanoids that grew up in such an environment would actually be like. Would they be anything like that? Just fun, a little bit of science fiction to throw in there, all right? To think about Krypton and the red dwarf sun. Oh, they'd be a different galaxy, so I guess we'd be dealing with a different type of uh, density actually from a different galaxy where he would come from but still nonetheless what would the beings and all the different creatures be like from that system I when I view in there and kind of start tuning in I don't remote view the same way I did take one remote viewing class with Princess Janae uh, when I spoke with her in Helen Georgia last year but um, it's actually pretty ac accurate at it but I can see actually too so when I actually look in there what I'm seeing is um, kind of uh, the seventh planet 
is very active as well. Although it's on the edge out there, and all these planets are supposed to be tidally locked, meaning that they don't turn like Earth would all the way and expose the sun. They're gonna have one side that's always light and dark and in that situation. So it'd be different, and the beings that will come up there is different. I think that these colonizing and the life carriers that might be in that area, I think it's a hot place. And what is the Webb telescope going to see? And something I want to throw out real quick before I sign off here is that I know a lot of remote viewers watch my channel. Why don't you all start communicating, communicating the communi in, the, in the comments section. I'm going to actually throw this out and throw a shout out to my friend Jessica Jones who started a different show on YouTube called uh, Jessica Remote Viewing Investigations with Jessica Jones. So she's a remote viewer of a very advanced level. So I think Jessica, tune into that. Maybe I know you got a thousand targets, but targets, but choose that one. Maybe John Vavinko, I don't really speak to him anymore, but if he hears about this, I would recommend that uh, type of a target for him. All the remote viewers start tuning in. You can communicate on my platform here. What do you see? Do you see any commonalities with what this guy, Duddy, or Buddy Bolton saw? So that's one of the things there, right? So thank you very much for the people on Patreon that really are sponsoring me and making these videos possible on YouTube. Thank you for the pleasant comments I've been getting. My subscriber count has gone up, although the view count has gone down. Some algorithm shadow banning, but it's gotten better. So please hit that bell and hit, hit the uh, subscribe and hit that bell so you'll get notified when I put new stuff up. Uh, thank you very much. Much love and peace.